Oh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aileen Ionescu Summers. I am the executive director of Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And you're in the right place. We're here today to discuss a um, policy brief uh, report that we have written um, uh, in collaboration with the um, WeFi, which is the Women Entrepreneurs uh, Finance Initiative. And specifically, the brief concerns women entrepreneurs in emerging economies. Um, and what we wanted to do is to profile lessons on segmentation and care needs from the pandemic that we all went through. This is a very important topic, care needs, as we were just discussing just before we started. Care needs have not been really um, analyzed in depth and it's very difficult to get data uh, concerning care needs and women. Um, and so hopefully we'll have a very interesting conversation here. Um, now, speak, we have some speakers with us today. Of course, we have Amanda Elam, who is the lead author of this report. Um, but we also have uh, Tanima Ahmed. Welcome, Tanima, who is an economist with the World Bank Group's Invest in Childcare Initiative and Gender Group. So a veritable expert in this whole area of care. Um, I'm just going to give you a chance in a moment, Tanima, to introduce yourself um, and describe your role. But I also want to mention that we will have Wendy Taleki, who is um, the head of the WeFi uh, initiative, uh, which is also part of the World Bank Group. Um, Wendy will be joining us just a little bit later. She's transitioning from another meeting, but it really will be just two or three minutes before she joins us. Um, and so in the meantime, I'm going to ask you, Tani Man, to maybe describe your role at the World Bank and how, how you are working in women's entrepreneurship. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I am Tani Mohamed. Hi, everyone. Um, I am an economist uh, uh, with the Invest in Child Care Initiative and the gender group, very much related to what I do uh, on care. Uh, mainly my work is I, I approach, uh, my work in uh, care goes uh, in the direction of uh, how we ensure women's labor market participation, right? And we know that when we talk about women's labor market participation, it's women uh, who are working in the formal sector, women's who, women's who are entrepreneurs, women's uh, in in different sector, in different uh, occupations. So my work is very much connected to uh, ensuring to bring these women entrepreneurs or how we can support them with the care uh, and how, how it is an obstacle and how we can solve this problem that we're seeing right now. So um, in that way, and we are also uh, working very closely on testing some of the models or where we can think about women entrepreneurs in the care sector, right? Women can come out. It's a new sector. It's some, somewhere women can be entrepreneur also uh, uh, in care, I mean, providing care support or uh, uh, some, um, in, in that area. So my work really focuses on that uh, completely. I'll stop here and back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Tanima. Um, so it's great to know that you're with us. And, and really, I think you're going to give a very interesting perspective on the findings of the report. Um, Wendy has not joined us yet, but we'll go immediately to um, Amanda, who, as I said, was lead author of, of this report. And Amanda is going to bring us through some slides with the main messages from the research and that are linked to the theme of um, of the report. Um, may I just uh, suggest that you already start, if you have questions or comments, uh, to put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will try later on in this uh, webinar to field your questions and to answer any of the queries that you might send in. Um, so over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with me, uh, Amanda Elam, I'm a, a sociologist and researcher um, at Babson College, and I've used GEM data for many years, and I work closely with uh, GEM Global on the women's entrepreneurship research, and this is one project that's culminated uh, from this, uh, this perspective um, in the GEM program. So for this collaboration with the WeFi team, um, we had specific 
questions that um, we wanted to answer. So this is a uh, report uses um, data from uh, you know 2019 through 2021. So the question right now is what lessons can we draw from the COVID-19 pandemic to better support women entrepreneurs in emerging economies? And I know that much of the world has kind of moved on from the pandemic, but for researchers, we're still mining the data to better understand what's happening. And I think from an international development perspective, everyone understands that it's usually the most vulnerable groups in society that um, suffer disproportionately from you know, the impact of economic crises, uh, natural disasters, and disease epidemics. And that's exactly what happened there. And among the most vulnerable are women entrepreneurs um, in the marketplace. So we were really interested in asking what were the pandemic, what evidence do we have that women were uh, in, in low income and emerging economies were differentially impacted? What were the mitigating factors? Were there other factors that um, helped support their resilience or um, uh, provided better outcomes? And then what were the important factors in the enabling environment? And then finally, we were looking at policy solutions, specifically um, some recommendations to help policymakers and programmers better uh, think about women's entrepreneurship in this kind of a global crisis. So uh, moving forward. So I think when we're looking at uh, entrepreneurship, uh, we're, we're looking at the creation of new businesses. Right. So we're also we're also interested in how established businesses fare, but but specifically around the creation of new businesses. So for us, we looked at the entry rates, so the creation of new firms and the exit rates uh, for women in uh, in countries around the world. And the bottom line here is that women in lower income countries um, were the only group across all men and women, groups of men and women around the world um, who really experienced um, a higher rate of the ratio of entry to exit. So in other words, women starting businesses often um, don't start businesses at the same rate as men. Men tend to be a little bit higher. Um, and they also are less likely to exit businesses for the same reason. But if we look at the ratio, we can see that uh, women were really, not only did they have a significant drop in the number of businesses they were creating in lower income countries, um, but they also experienced um, you know, a higher exit rate in 2020, which calmed down in 2021. So I would direct your eyes to the top right quadrant, looking at lower income countries. Um, and this is what the women in these countries experienced. Now, men in lower income countries experienced something similar, a similar pattern, but not as sharp. As, as what the women did. So next slide. Um, so in ten, again, as I mentioned, we're also interested in established businesses. In the GEM program, startups are businesses less than 42 months old, three and a half years, and, uh, and established businesses are those who are, that are a little bit older, three and a half years or older. And again, looking across years, 2019, 2020, 2021, um, what you see here is that, as I mentioned, the, the rates are lower for women in owning businesses, um, but in the lower middle income businesses, in the lower left part of the slide there, you'll see that, um, there was a much bigger disparity in the established businesses rate from um, 2019, the blue bars down to 2020, and then up again um, a little bit in 2021. So um, women's businesses dropped 22% in lower income countries. Those established business closure rates were, um, were ownership rates were lower and there was some modest discovery. And if you compare that to men on the right side of the chart, um, in the same context, lower income countries, um, there was much less uh, of an initial impact and, um, and it continued. So next slide. So I'm moving quickly through this, but you can read the report for all the gory details. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a, sort of a quick overview on the data. Um, when we look at the reasons for business in um, exit, this is another big question we have is how are women differentially impacted? And I think it's really important to see here that the women in lower income countries were about 75% more likely um, than similar men to report 
report family as a reason for business closure. So we have Tanima on the call to talk about care work today um, and are looking forward to some of her um, insights around this. Again, if we look in the lower left hand, uh, the lower, the far left column for women in lower income countries, um, you'll see that the gray bar is bigger than in, for any other um, group there. And so women in lower income countries were much more likely to say they closed their business because of family. Also due to the uh, pandemic, we actually saw the highest um, closures there for women in upper middle income countries, um, which uh, was a bit of a surprise and also something worth um, unpacking. Next slide. All right, so as I mentioned, we were interested in the impacts, but we're also interested in the mitigating factors and the GEM data provided us with some good questions. We were able to look at, you know, what new opportunities um, emerging from the pandemic looked like uh, for both startups and for established firms. And for women, you'll notice that, uh, well, you'll notice in general, the blue bars are higher than the orange bars. That means that startups, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, new entrepreneurs were much more optimistic and saw much more opportunity come out of the pandemic than those in established firms. However, if you look at the women in the lower income countries, they were more likely than anybody else in the world in their categories of startup and established businesses to say that they saw new opportunities coming out of the pandemic, over 50% of uh, new business owners um, in lower income countries um, saw new opportunities come out of the pandemic. And that's a thrilling result. Um, another measure on our next slide is the use of new digital tools. So here again, you'll see that women in lower income countries um, really, especially in startups, but they really sort of outdid everyone else, every other group in the world of men and women um, in terms of using new digital tools. Now, this is a this is a pro and a con measure. On the pro side, the there's evidence showing that the use of new digital tools significantly reduced the impacts of the pandemic. So in other words, reduced the the loss of revenue and uh, and helped increase or grow revenue during the pandemic for some companies. Um, however, what we see is the most vulnerable groups really didn't have a choice because of the market disruptions. They had to go digital to connect with their um, their customers. And so there are some of the challenges and other research um, we've done. And we know that uh, there are some access challenges. So the cost and the complexity of using these digital, these new digital digital tools can be uh, quite challenging for, um, you know, new entrepreneurs and and really small businesses. Yet, what we find is that um, these women in lower income countries really went at it. And you'll also see that the men in lower income countries similarly um, outdid men in other countries for the adoption of new digital tools. Next, <clears throat> and. Finally, for mitigating factors, we also, we looked at the effectiveness of the government economic response. So this is a perception, right? So they're saying, this is how we feel about it. Um, and if you'll notice the lower bar, again, looking at startups and established businesses, women in lower income countries were much more likely to, uh, to agree that, that their government economic response was favorable. Now, whether that is due to um, economic relief, the size of economic relief for small businesses in these settings, or the fact that they got anything when normally they don't is a really good question for further research. Um, but it's very exciting. And I think really reflects the, the optimism um, and resilience of, of women in these lower income settings. All right. And then another so the earlier measures were taken from the uh, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Adult Population Survey, where we have representative samples of um, men and women in of working age, uh, you know, in countries around the world. I think um, last year was um, uh, forty seven countries, and and our comparative data, I think we had uh, over thirty. Um, we also have another data set in the GEM program called the National Expert Survey, and that's where we go out to the countries that are participating um, and we interview experts about their environment. So what it's like for entrepreneurs trying to start and grow businesses in these environments. And in 2021, we were really fortunate 
that uh, the NES survey included six measures that specifically looked at the enabling environment for women. And these, these questions included questions about cultural support for women, family support services for women that women entrepreneurs can benefit from, favorable regulations for women business owners, access to procurement for business owners, access to financing for business owners, and, and finally, um, the availability of telework solutions that could really help um, uh, entrepreneurs. And here we're looking, we're comparing high income, upper middle income countries and lower income countries. Um, and what you find here is that again, the lower income countries, the blue bars, um, uh, it's, it's pretty painful for, on most of the measures. <laughs> Right, they're sort of lagging behind other countries when it comes to uh, these enabling and factors specifically for women. And I think that these, that in this way, this is where policymakers and program leaders can really draw some insight. The experts in your countries um, may not feel that there are good support systems in place to help women business owners, and that's something you can further explore in the report. Um, and then finally, we end the report with um, some specific recommendations. Um, I, having worked with the, the GEM data for gender research for a long time, I think, um, and as a gender scholar myself, I think it's really important, the concept of segmentation. And that is that we know that industry sector and business size are the two most important predictors for many outcomes when we're studying entrepreneurship. Uh, gender differences in entrepreneurship. So you really need to, to understand the segments, right? The needs of women tech entrepreneurs are very different from women who are working in, uh, you know, small consumer markets or different from those working in financial, government, education, healthcare services. Um, so segmentation is, is one recommendation. Pay attention to that and tailor policy for specific segments because the experience for women can be very different. Um, also, family policy for small businesses. This is one of the most important learnings from uh, COVID is when our system shut down, women disproportionately um, bore the brunt. And one of the reasons why we think a lot of women entrepreneurs had higher rates of, um, you know, of, of uh, business shutdowns of the entry exit ratio and also um, the um, and also the drop in established business rates is because they had to they had to care for family and our reasons for business ex exit really um, drive that home. So governments, when we go through these, these crises, whether it's economic, natural disaster or disease epidemic, we really need to think about how those symptoms will disproportionately um, impact different, uh, different individuals in the economy and make adjustments to uh, mitigate those. I think cultural support and business networks for women's entrepreneurship, this is a long standing standing uh, perspective on what women entrepreneurs really, really need. They're often shut out from the most powerful business networks. And, uh, and of course, they face uh, significant bias against women's in leadership. Again, when we control for things like industry sector and business size, there are no gender differences in business outcomes in many parts of the world. However, um, if women are going into it and everyone thinks they're going to fail, they may th themselves think they're going to fail and they need extra support to overcome some of the gender bias that tends to dominate in business communities. And then finally, we have evidence that digital tools um, were important for entrepreneurs, but that the costs and the accessibility can be limited, especially in low income settings. Uh, and so I think this is, is associated with, you know, our larger uh, gender differences and the use of mobile phones and access to the internet. Um, these are definitely gaps that need to be addressed in order to position women entrepreneurs around the world better for uh, business startup and growth. And Ailey and I will pass the microphone back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Very interesting and concise. Um, I actually want to welcome uh, Wendy Telecki, who is the head of the WeFi Secretariat, the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative. Uh, welcome, Wendy. Um, and uh, before I go to Wendy with the first question, actually, um, I just uh, want to do, I'm looking at the Q&A and there's a, a few little housekeeping questions. Um, first one is, is it possible to put a definition or some parameters around entrepreneur for the context of this discussion 
micro small enterprises concept establish revenue employees can you just clarify that amanda please yeah absolutely that is a great question thank you orla um so in the gem research program entrepreneur by definition is uh, a business owner and manager right and we distinguish between people who are doing nascent activities so in the process of starting a business those who actually have a business early stage entrepreneur and are running a business less than three and a half years old and then those who have an established business three and a half years old or older is what we mean by established business thank you okay since um which countries are included in the lower income category well, uh, yeah, I let you also answer that, Amanda. Right. So a very small number. It's actually one of the most painful aspects of doing cross-national research. Um, the country teams have to raise the money to participate in the research program. And so um, we had um, very few countries um, participate in the lower income category. This is, yeah. um, this is an area yeah. where we struggle with GEM because GEM can be quite an expensive um, research on <laughs> enterprise um, to carry out the survey, you know, with so many people um, it is an expensive undertaking. So lower income uh, countries do struggle to, um, to do the research. Um, uh, what does the other category represent for reasons of business failure other than family reasons? Right. Well, it isn't always business failure. That's why we use the word exit. <laughs> Sometimes they sell their business and it it's a, it can be a good story. Sometimes it's exiting for retirement um, or other uh, potentially more positive uh, reasons. So that other category is uh, is everything. Sometimes it's government regulation. It can be market shutdowns. So it's a mix of, of uh, positive and negative um, alternative reasons for exit. But our focus is on the big ones which is lack of profitability is the number one reason around the world. Okay, and there's another kind of housekeeping question, which is, does the report segment the population of women by race, ethnic, age, and a sexual orientation? It does not, um, and for a very good reason in the GEM program. Um, country teams can, can add measures to it if they want that kind of segmentation within their country, but we don't do that globally just because it varies by country. Um, so not <laughs> not easy to do that when, uh, you know, race and certainly the social status associated with different race or ethnic categories, um, you know, can vary pretty significantly from country to country. Um, also, there are, you know, countries, for example, like India, where they have a caste system um, and it's not easy to translate, you know, in other cultures. OK. All right. Now. Yeah, the housekeeping over. <laughs> um, I'll turn to you, Wendy. Um, great to have you with us. Um, I wonder, you know, I gave a chance to Tanima to introduce what she does, you know, in just literally a, a few bullets or a few in one minute. Um, Wendy, can you maybe also describe your role at WeFi and very uh, briefly the reason for the strategic intention to uh, partner with GEM to publish this report? Oh, you're on, you're on mute, you sorry. Yes, we can, yes. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me today and for all this amazing work. And I apologize for not being here right when we started. Um, so um, I'm, I run the Secretariat for the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, uh, which is a global program that sits in the World Bank and supports all of the multilateral development banks around the world to provide uh, financing and other skills development for women. Um, entrepreneurs. Uh, we're in about 60 countries. We've helped catalyze about $1.2 billion in funding for women entrepreneurs. Um, and we're working with about 250 different partners around the world. So for us, it's really, really critical that we have good data and evidence on what's working, how what the constraints are for women, um, what's how things look differently in different countries. And that's really the reason why we've been partnering for a few years now with the GEM research is to make sure that we can see this data, understand the data, and that it will help us in our operations. So uh, especially, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we were all kind of flying blind, trying to understand what was going on and the on the ground research that GEM has um, and can get insights at the local level has been really, really important. 
great, Wendy. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I know that you've actually read the report as well, um, but and I think you heard probably most of the presentation. So I'm wondering, can you give us your reaction to what you have read and heard? And um, feel free, you know, to share your observations. And maybe you could include a little bit why why these results are informative for WeFi and what you can actually specifically do with the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, it is uh, a sobering report, I would say. Um, there's a lot in there that um, uh, gives us pause, but I would say there's some uh, elements of positive um, positivity in there that I think we want to build on. Um, we really, um, you know, for us, entrepreneurship is a critical path to economic empowerment for women. And we think globally there's about a five to six trillion dollar value gap uh, because women are not competing at the same levels of men. And that is throughout the cycle. And one of the things I like about the research is it looks at startups and mature companies because those groups can have very different effects. You know, we also know that these entrepreneurs are the, um, you know, they are a really critical part of the growth story in these countries. And we want to, but they're they're constrained. And I think when we see in the data, you know, it's been such a volatile time coming out of the pandemic, but when we see in the data, this level of exits and also startups going down, that's very concerning, right? Now, we're not, you know, there's a difference between opportunity and necessity entrepreneurs. So, you know, it's just creating lots of businesses and they're, you know, that aren't going to grow or they're going to fail. That's, it's important part of the churn, but what we really want to see is strong businesses growing. And this is where, you know, we hope that this data is, um, that there's, there's a, you know, it's, there's more dynamism underneath coming out of this than, um, you know, what it looks like when you see fewer startups and um, and more uh, more exits. So that's a that's a concern for us. Um, we do what you asked about our you know operations. We do do a lot in terms of capacity building for women, um, trying to get them to understand how to improve their business, how to become more productive. We're very focused on getting women into more productive sectors. So wanting to make sure whenever possible, we're encouraging women to even work in sectors that aren't traditionally women with a lot of women led businesses. So moving into these higher productive businesses that can scale rather than some of the businesses that are really, um, you know, not not going to allow them to grow beyond, you know, a, a very basic level of, of income. So productivity and, and sector selection is is really important. Um, the the and, and the other thing I would say is the difference between low income and middle income. Now, I know the data set doesn't have a huge number of low income, but you know it, it's worse. It, you know it's worse in these countries. They're affected by not just the pandemic, but the roar in Russia and the food insecurity, yeah. natural disasters, climate change. So there's a lot of lot of challenges that they're facing that are even more acute in those markets and more acute for women. And all the data shows that. But on the positive side, I mean, I think we saw benefits from the targeting coming out of the pandemic. There was a lot of work to target and make sure women were being included in the public sector programs. So they were clearly feeling that. And this it's really great for the data to show that. And it shows us that policy uh, actions can make a difference and that they can uh, you know, get to, to women. Um, whether you, as you said, it's a perception or reality, you know, so they're starting with a lower bar maybe is, is part of why they're feeling it more. Um, but, but that was really heartening to see. And then I think getting back to the question of dynamism and trying to promote dynamic businesses and not just, you know, necessity entrepreneurs, which are, you know, important, but we really want to help them grow. These the the findings about new opportunities and digital tools really caught my eye because those are where I see, you know, women stepping in to really tackle big challenges, to innovate, to find new ways of working. Maybe they're solving their childcare problems by finding an innovative business solution 
for others in childcare, or they're dealing with climate change and creating businesses there. So we see a lot of interesting solutions being developed by women. And I see that coming out of those two data indicators, right? The, the fact that they're more likely to use digital tools, more willing to innovate with the digital tools, that will be the path of the future and then new opportunities. And you know, we saw a lot of women doing things in the healthcare space during the pandemic, a lot more working on climate space now that that's such a big topic. So education, you know, they're working on these big development challenges also, and that's where we want to also put our efforts to support them. Okay, thank you very, very much. A very interesting perspective in terms of, you know, how you will move forward strategically as an organization using data of this kind to actually direct your um, your steps. Um, Tanima, you come from a very, I, I presume, a very, yeah, there might be similarities, but a very different perspective uh, in terms of what you do. And I'm wondering what resonated most for you, you know, both from the report and from what you've heard from Amanda just now. What resonates and um, in terms of the work that you do with women entrepreneurs and um, maybe add some perspectives on the themes of this report um, as regards segmentation and care needs um, in terms of your learning and perhaps something that may not have come out here in the discussion so far today. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me here. And then the report was, uh, and let me be a part of this, the report was really great. And I was many times when I was reading this report, I'm like, wow, I mean, I didn't, I, I couldn't, I, I see the data coming out. Sometimes it's like, show. I'm surprised sometimes to see the, you know, the findings. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, I know like this is happening, but this gives us the data as uh to kind of show what's what's happening. So of course, I come from the perspective of care. I work in care uh, completely. I I am I'm part of the child care initiative, but also when it comes to care economy, uh, I think care as a whole. I mean, of course. I felt like when I was reading the report that yes, family reasons is a big reason uh, where 75% of women said it. And that's definitely like a big number where we didn't see that number for men. That kind of indicates like how women gets affected by this kind of, you know, care. I mean, care is always women's responsibility. And it's pretty much very evident when you were seeing this report um, that women saying they, they, they exited the market just because the family reasons where we don't see it for the men. So I think this kind of this kind of uh, follows the results we were sh also seeing in general for the labor for force participation exit for women during the pandemic. We had an ILO report saying two million mothers exited the market because of this very reason, which is unpaid care work. But I think one of the things that when we say family reasons, we need to unpack this a bit more um, during my work. And I think there are multiple things going, I think, went on during the pandemic. The first of course, we always talk about childcare. I mean, this is a big reason where daycare centers closed, or even you can think about school closed and children were staying at home and the childcare demand has increased. But then another part of the care economy is also adult care. Another part of the care economy is also goes to elder care, right? There was more um the pandemic was happening uh and there was more um diseases so women needed to stay at like home or take care of the, the adults as well so that also increased the burden on them too and then if you go towards the as there's a lot of things happening as you can also see think about like the telecommuting right people were staying at home and working where women needed to you know women does most of the domestic chores women does most of the household work so there was also they did not have any external support coming in like or maybe the domestic helper to help them so that also increased the care burden and I would say care responsibility for them to make them to exit. So I think unpacking that is very important when we think about this kind of like what kind of interventions we will think about going forward because care economy is a very broad, broad subject. It, it not, as I said, it not only includes child care, it includes elder care, it includes adult care, it also includes unpaid domestic work, which increased for women. So I, I found it pretty 
kind of resonating. And then one of the other thing, and I really appreciate that the report mentioned it is norms. I think there was somewhere the report was not completely saying it's norms, but it was also showing that how the lower income um, countries and especially where their norms are binding, even though women had intentions to start a business, but th that that cannot happen. They cannot like that cannot translate to what they're thinking because of the binding norms that's there. So I think uh, mentioning that is also very important because care and norms that all kind of goes together. And that was completely resonating with me when I was reading this report. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I can see uh, where the norms are binding, the care responsibility has increased. So I really appreciated that angle because, you know, so far we have seen a lot of, lot of reports talking about it in general, but what happened to women entrepreneurs? What is the data saying? We haven't seen much on that, like on care side and women. So I really appreciated that that's coming out. And that definitely helps us, right? When we are working, we're going to the governments and saying, hey, look, this is a big binding. This is a big constraints for women. This report exactly is what we need to say. Like, look at the data. Like, seventy-five percent of women saying the family reasons to do not not be in the labor market. One of the other thing, I mean, I I really found it really fascinating to see that women are so resilient. They still found positivity yeah. in this whole pandemic, and I, I was. It is incredible, yeah. <laughs> it is incredible. I mean, they still were saying government has provided them support. They still were like looking for this top pandemic as a new opportunity. And I'm like, that's really a great thing and that you see that how women are thinking, even in this um, in this hardship, they're thinking very positive about it, that no, I'm seeing opportunity rather than I'm, I'm not seeing an opportunity in this as well. But I think one of the things that I, I personally, in my experience and from my work in this care economy, I wanted to bring out and also see that what does this resilience mean to us, right? I mean, the one thing is, I mean, it can happen that yes, women are uh, women are continuing their business, um, but then there is also a penalty coming through profit, right? Uh, sometimes women bring their children um, to the workplace to their businesses. They they work in sectors where they do it because they have flexibility, as you know that many of the entrepreneurs may be opening their. Uh, businesses nearby so that they can take care of their family as well as they can um, they can manage their you know uh, care work uh, responsibility as well as their business responsibility so I think there is this issue um, that needs to come out as well that what does it mean even if women are not exiting the market w what does it look like for them even if they're staying in the uh, in, in the scene uh, one is definitely as I said profit gap can happen uh, between men and women because women are trying to balance both of them but other issues that I always try to kind of underline is that sometimes you know when we look at this area it's not even if women are working sometimes they have double burden of work so even if the women are not exiting the market they are continuing it can also happen their their total work time is way more than uh, a man they are doing household work they are doing care work they are taking care of the market work they are taking care of so um even even in you will see normal normally like if you see the evidence it's always women's total work time is more than men's uh even when they're working and in any circumstances so i think underlining that is also very important because um, that is very stressful as well that even if you're not exiting even if you're the most resilient but then still there is a policy issue here that we need to talk to gov like we need need intervention for that you cannot have double burden of you know uh, responsibility you are doing all of this together mm -hmm. so I thought that um, that's something that also uh, I mean I, I'm maybe in future research <laughs> that I can say because maybe the data is not going to support it but also looking through that uh, we definitely see time use data where we see this kind of pattern where women are working double time so but overall I thought these results are in some way underlining what we knew and that that data we needed to to go to the governments and have this conversation with the other is there is also positivity there that women's are still thinking about uh, new opportunities. They, I found it really fascinating also about the digital take up that women are doing. So that that also shows their resilience, right? That the moment they had this issue, they started they started going to the digital. Um, they, they they kind of had that uptake. So I think 
there are many positive, but there are also, I think this shows us there's a lot to do as well. And especially, I think the COVID has underlined this issue of care, that enabling environment is very important. It's not only about the issue of care, but I think it also comes with the issue of norms. We may provide child care support or we may provide elder care support, but if the norms are binding, we still may not see um, the impact that we want to see. So I think Talking about both of them together will be uh, much more important. Tackling that is much more important, but I'm I'm really happy to see this this report and really underlining the things and and giving us some data to have this conversation. Um, so, thank you, Tanima. I'll stop up here and yeah. Okay, I'm I'm actually interested, um, Amanda, any observations you might have about what's just been said by Wendy and Tanima. And also, if you don't mind, sometimes it's interesting to go into the mind of the researcher, you know, and I, I, I think it's very interesting to hear sometimes about, you know, what what may have frustrated you or what did what challenges did you have in writing the report? So either of those things, you know, reactions to what you've heard so far and then your your challenges. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give a couple. Okay. Um, so I'll I'll say that listening to Wendy and uh, Tanma has really made me think a lot about um, the intersection between segmentation and care work. So, for example, Wendy and Tanma both talked about the idea of, you know, women being able to better juggle um, the household demands um, with uh, with a business startup, a lot of we we see this in the entrepreneurship literature, right? We have, some people don't like the term, but they use the term mompreneurs. <laughs> so yeah. women around the world are are finding ways to create income by starting businesses at the kitchen table or garage or whatever. Um, and that's certainly you know one important aspect of what we see. Men also start businesses um, so they can stay closer to home, whether they're dealing with disabilities or family care. Um, issues or want the autonomy of, of um, having something that's remote. Um, so I think that that's really important um, to understand that that segmentation. I mean, I think that women, for example, you know, who are running a factory or, uh, you know, a laboratory or something where, the, where you have to show up to get the work done to serve your customer, you have to you be there. Um, and and so I think that that's really an important distinction. What types of policies or programs are in place for people who can't be at home taking, who can't do the juggle from home, who have to be on site? Um, I think the other insight is, uh, well, I think the other response is really about the challenges. And I think that this is, a, you know, as a sociologist by training, I have a very holistic view of the world. And it's always frustrated me that you know, much of the research is focused on the workplace and the marketplace as something disconnected from the home. Whereas I think most women, if we're talking about female labor force participation, most women who are working, they, we are working around the clock, right? And so it's really frustrating um, to, to see all this research that completely assumes that home factors don't influence what's happening in the workplace. And the truth is it does for men and women. And so, but we consider it a woman's issue. It's time to end that. Yeah. Right? Time yeah. for us to move beyond that and, and understand that, you know, I think the classic feminist um, term was, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the private is public. It has, it has an influence. Anything that happens in the home influences what happens in the marketplace. And, and so that's, that's where my frustration would be from as a researcher, because we have so many data sets collecting excellent data, but they don't pay any attention to family situation. Um, and then the normative piece of that, I'm of building off what you talked about is, you know, that it is, it's always been a woman's issue because of, of those gender norms around household arrangements, right? And there's also a power differential in the household that influences, um, you know, uh, women's entrepreneurship. We see this a lot in the research, things like, you know, a woman um, starts a business, but it can't get too big because, you know, she's got to take care of things at home because her husband, her, you know, her male family members don't help with that stuff, right? Whereas they can travel, they can, they're mobile, they're not worried about security, they've got all of this stuff, all of this freedom to go out and really build a company. And the other piece of that is we also see in the literature, many stories where, women start businesses, the businesses do well, and then the male family members come in and take over. I'm not sure the reverse happens very often. <laughs> right? 
so so I think there's I think that that would I would say one of my challenges in looking specifically at care work and I think this was part of our conversations with WeFi is we have limited data available um and then finally of course the biggest challenge is we just don't have a lot of data from developing countries so that's a place where I would love to see sponsorship come in um, to sponsor teams and we already do this in the gem program we have a lot of scholars, um, you know, like world-class scholars who serve on multiple teams. They might serve on a team for their home country, but they also serve on teams mm -hmm. for, for countries where, you know, they they have less experience. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have to learn how to do the kind of research that, that we do, but I would love to see sponsorship come in and, and help make that happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Wendy, um, so I'm turning now to kind of policymakers, which of course, um, this is this is one of the biggest challenges for us at GEM. Uh, we want to influence policymakers. We want to be relevant for, for policymakers. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you think policymakers might pick up on these uh, results? I mean, um, Amanda actually pointed to, I think, four areas um, where policymakers could do some very um, concrete and tangible things. Um, yeah, but give, give me your impression, you know, how quickly or how likely or, you know, what's the context there as far as you can see it, Wendy? Yeah, again, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think this, um, I, I, I'm just going to go back to that silver lining here, which is that, you know, we did see a little bit of things working with in terms of assistance during the pandemic. So there's a way to target programs when you're really focused on it, on women. But the enabling environment numbers and the research are really bad, right? It's just not good for women in low income countries. It's even worse you know, women are really not supported by the enabling environment. Mm -hmm. And it's across it's across the board. We see it in terms of, uh, you know, just your general legal issues around mobility and legal structure and ability to own and transfer assets. Um, but and we see it in the finance space where, you know, they're not, um, we don't even have the data on how much financing is going to women and whatnot. So the 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 fact that you know the the enabling environment is still so poor for women entrepreneurs um, really has a big impact on their ability to grow and thrive, and it has this dampening effect, right? Where women are just not growing and not accelerating because it's too complicated. On top of all the other burdens that we've already talked about in the care, you know, their care burdens, family obligations, um, maybe, you know, they've their training, um, the, the enabling environment really creates a, a dampening effect on their ability to grow. So governments need to focus on it, number one, and then take a gender lens to different things that they're doing so that their policies, you know, if they're doing gender budgeting, if they're doing, you know, any kind of policy, they need to be thinking about it from a gender lens. Um, right. we, we, like one thing we could do a lot better on is procurement. Governments procure huge amounts. They procure childcare services. They procure healthcare services. They procure, you know, products, clothing, all kinds of things. And if they use that procurement power to support women entrepreneurs or to recognize that they need maybe different ways to bring women entrepreneurs into their procurement paths at different levels, you know, different like the micros and what they might do and the smalls or the growth companies and what they might do. And also in the non-traditional sectors. So trying, you know, if you're procuring something in the technology space, are there women providers out there who you might not have even thought about working with? We have a program in Latin America with the Islamic Development Bank where they're working with STEM entrepreneurs to build up their companies, to incubate, accelerate them. And also working with corporates to try to bring more women into their value chains. And some of those corporates are finding those tech companies that they never expected to find that are women led. So really, there's a lot about transparency and being purposeful about trying to make sure policies and actions like procurement are actually equitable. And, and that 
you know, that helps women who are in some of these traditional sectors, like the healthcare sectors, childcare sectors, who might want to be innovators, who might want to be entrepreneurs in those spaces, but also women in non-traditional sectors. The other thing that's really important is the data side and the digitization. So digitization has several very positive impacts. It helps with women who need to have more flexibility in their homes and work late at night when the kids are asleep or um, you know, if they can't, they need to juggle a bunch of things. It also is an opportunity to get a lot more data and have alternative um, ways of measuring uh, and supporting women entrepreneurs. So if you look at the finance space where I work a lot, getting women onto digital platforms, getting them onto, you know, using digital technologies in their businesses, digital value chains can help as we develop more alternative scoring mechanisms and use data to get more financing out to them. So if women are, if what we see here is that women might be more open to adapting technologies and introducing new technologies, that's gonna benefit them in many ways, including by the way, the targeting from governments because most of that's digital now. I mean, not most of it, but a lot of it is moving towards digital and that's a really promising area for, for providing support. So um, so we see that the digitization, getting more women online, getting the training, getting them to understand the safety issues around digital, and also just the get over the fear, you know, any fear factor they might have, or um, also the gender norms, because often in a household, the digital um, activities are kind of controlled by the men or the youth. And the women don't have their own phone or they don't have their own um, you know, access to computers. So making sure the gender norms are tackled as well and women are seen as primary users of digital technologies and they're empowered to use that to maximum benefit for their, uh, for their businesses. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, those comments. Um, I think there's a very interesting discussion in the, in the Q&A about whether we should abandon comparative studies between men and women and focus solely on women entrepreneurs, uh, comparing countries and supplementing with a discursive study. Um, this is a comment from Fatem Boutaleb, who is the lead of our Moroccan team. Um, her comment is, I suppose there's more heterogeneity among women than among male entrepreneurs. There's a lot to discover about the culture and specific characteristics of women entrepreneurs around the world so we can provide them with better support. And above all, there's the need to get away from the male prism to better rethink and understand female entrepreneurship. So I'm going to ask you what your reaction to that is, uh, Tanima. I think um, my reaction to that is I, I personally think we need to bring men in because we talked about norms right now. So I think it's the issue of when we work in this area, I personally think it's an issue of recognition for sure. Recognize that this is an issue and that has been a challenge, although I would say pandemic actually underlined this issue and it's a good news for us that now we are recognizing it uh, to an extent but still the challenge remains when we talk to the government but the other part is redistributing it because I can talk about uh, like women that but whenever we are going for an intervention if we only give like caregiving is a responsibility of both father and the mother so I think uh, it's time that we talk about also we bring in men I mean uh, the data when we focus on the data as well like when when we compare men and women this kind of uh, gaps like really comes out so I am I am in support of doing bringing in also men and doing both uh, because that that highlights the gap right? That tells us that there is an issue. And then that also tells us that when we are doing the policy intervention, it's not only that we are trying to help the women, but we are also bringing men in the equation. So for instance, I always talk about uh, maternal leave, maternity leave or you go for parental leave. And I think it should be gender neutral to an extent because you think about the daycare center is not only needed for uh, women, but it's also needed for men. There can be also single fathers who need support on childcare and all these others. So I think 
it's I'm 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 definitely thinking that intervention should be uh, targeted towards women because women are facing the issue and the norms needs to be corrected. But we, if we don't have the data and we don't have the comparison with the men, it will be an issue because we don't know where men are standing either. So I think it's important to have that and then have our um, intervention designed in a way so that we can recognize, redistribute and at the same time reduce this care burden or care responsibility and and kind of have a have an equity there so um that's that's where i am standing <laughs> yeah and i mean um ulrike gillick who is uh, our um lead in uh, thailand comments it depends on the country i still believe that we can learn a lot about comparing um at least for me here in thailand it helps to point out to our funding government agency where different support measures are needed. Um, so Wendy, coming back to you, um, and we're pretty much going to have to wrap up soon. So I'm wondering about a future perspective. Um, in fact, can you put it in a nutshell what your organization's vision is for women's entrepreneurship um, and whether, you know, organizations such as GEM can make a difference when it comes to promoting this vision in the future. You have actually referred to that before. So perhaps um, focus on that vision, you know, for your organization, what more can be done? Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, what more can be done in women's entrepreneurship research? Yeah. So first of all, I, I wanted to come back to the point about men versus women and the point about segmentation. I think it is really important to understand the women's market and understand women and their experience as entrepreneurs, you know, in a holistic way. We know that there's their women are very different and the gender norms and the unintended biases that we all have make us think about women entrepreneurs in a specific box. But actually, there's a lot of different women entrepreneurs out there and doing really interesting things that we don't think about. So I think that the issue of segmentation is really important. And the to, to us, the main question is how do you migrate more women entrepreneurs into productive, uh, more productive, more profitable, more growth businesses um, is really, you know, what we're, what we're focused on. So what is the dynamics there of how you create growth how you create productivity, how you create competitiveness um, in these sectors. You know, how do you create more women who trade, for example? How do you create more women who are doing, you know, manufacturing or other things that, that you don't normally think about? So that's really important. We are, uh, I mean, we're doing a lot. We're still doing a lot of training. We're doing a lot of capacity building. We do a lot of policy work. We have a big focus coming up on financial sector data. We have something we're introducing called the We Finance Code, uh, which is a, an effort to bring together the ecosystem of regulators, bankers, uh, banker, you know, financial associations, fintechs, our partners, um, standard setting bodies to really tackle the issue of WSME data in uh, emerging markets um, in the financial sector. So we're gonna be doing a lot of work and we're starting in about 20 countries and that's gonna be a big focus for us. Uh, but we're also trying to build up um, the evidence base. So uh, there's a lot of research out there. It's sporadic, you know, sometimes you have an RCT that's, you know, looked at 50 women in a small country. Sometimes you have something really big that you can look at, but we don't have a lot of data and evidence that's broad like this, right? And so what we're trying to do is fill in the gaps. And we've done an evidence paper that looked at our theory of change and said, what are the evidence, what evidence do we have? And if you look at actual evidence on the SME sector for women, it's very little. And so we're trying to build that out and fill in the gaps. We'll be doing an event, uh, a, a research event with EBRD in October. Um, I'm sure we'll we'll be sharing more information about that um, for researchers and others that are doing evaluations and whatnot. Um, it's in London on the 23rd and 24th. So uh, very uh, happy to share more about that. Um, and uh, we have a knowledge portal that tries to at least surface the different research that's been happening in different places on different things. So really trying to fill in those gaps because we want to we use that all of our multilateral development banks use that evidence base 
for practical purposes to work with regulators, to work with private sector partners that they have, to actually change the way institutions and governments are serving women entrepreneurs. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Tanima, I'm going to give the last word to you. <laughs> and um, uh, here's the question, uh, what, in, uh, what factors um, will make um, the most difference to the successful promotion of women's entrepreneurship in the future, according to you, your experience? I think uh, for me, I would think tackling the, I mean, where I come from, the tackling, uh, I mean, definitely improving the enabling environment. We have heard about it, that we are mm -hmm. hearing about it. The family reasons are the big reasons for women exiting the market. So I think definitely tackling norms and tackling uh, this unpaid care sector is, uh, is where we go. And that will definitely make a huge huge impact because we see in all the data that this is a big reason uh, where women are not participating or where women are facing the constraint. So I think tackling that will be will be very important. And from our work, as you know, we're, we now have an initiative, Invest in Child Care Initiative. World Bank is moving towards that direction at this point to kind of tackle the unpaid care work or recognize it and having um, also have the intervention. But there's a lot to do, to be honest. Uh, we need institutional uh kind of interventions we need to we need to talk about supply we need to talk about demand but those are the factors that i think uh those those are the things that will impact the most for the women entrepreneurs uh, okay thank you very very much for that um um i just like to say that um very very shortly we will be launching another report which is the uh 2022 23 uh, women's Entrepreneurship Report. Uh, it's a GEM report that is produced every year, a highly comprehensive overview of the state of the art, if you like, of women's entrepreneurship. So uh, watch our space on LinkedIn and we will inform you as to when we're going to be launching that report. It's very likely to be in um, late October, early November, uh, something around then. Um, we're finalizing it right now. Visit uh, gemconsortium.org and download the report. And I think uh, Kevin Anselmo, who I must thank for all the effort he put into putting this uh, webinar together. But I think Kevin has shared the link uh, to the report with you as participants. And I've highly enjoyed the discussion today. We could go on for another hour, I think. <laughs> and But it's been uh, really great to have you, uh, both Wendy and Tamnima and... Thank you for, for popping in uh, and participating in the webinar and especially thanks to Amanda for the fantastic work that she has done in writing this report. Um, and so um, Eileen, just to note that my colleague Farid has put some links in our in the comments in case people oh. want more information about the EBRD conference or our evidence paper. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. Yes, I see that now. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. So um, have a very nice rest of day. And uh, that's it. We're done. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Take care. Thank you.